Welcome to Disposable Design, a podcast about education and instructional design. We have a few strong opinions, a lot of research, and the occasional geek reference that nobody but nerds will get. My co-host and I wanted to start a podcast despite the fact that neither of us have the ability to stay on topic because we wanted to offer solutions to problems plaguing education today. So for our first podcast, we wanted to talk about the state of our industry. With the 2020 pandemic, online education has led to the forefront of education. We'll discuss the good, the bad, and the absolutely awful things we witnessed as both IDs and parents, and talk about some misconceptions people had and continue to have about instructional design. Not necessarily in order. (laughs) I could Photoshop you. (laughs) Me. My husband told me, if you didn't show up today... I have a I have a puppet and we were gonna do a Thomas puppet. Just saying. You're kinda flaky. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's not it's not lost on me. All right. Starting back where we were. Um yeah. why? Get my Google Drive over. Um and like not I guess to focus people's judgment and anger on the right people. Since I think a lot of parents went through the situation and, and, and like I did, for instance, my son's school had a really good setup for the first two weeks when everybody went remote in the fall. But after that, everyone was kind of just on their own. And so you can see when things are being guided by upper management and, and you know, the state and whatnot to a certain extent. And then you can tell where that guidance really ends. And then it's up to the individuals to do their best with the content and the resources that are available to them. And but virtually no training. They, and virtually no training. Yeah, you can tell when the guidance stops. Mm-hmm. And when the, the regulations, I guess, quote unquote, stop. Speaking of bad job and no training, um, personal antidote. One of the um, one of my daughter's teachers. He, he's a history teacher. You can tell he's a coach. You can tell he wasn't very comfortable with the with the whole online thing. And I knew they were in trouble the minute that um, he was giving a lecture and then he told the students to wait for about eight minutes, like go go off and do their do their thing for about eight minutes, and then we would come back and discuss. And he literally recorded silence for eight minutes in his lecture. And that was like, my mind is blown. These people need help. Like they, there's, they need help. Like this is, yeah, this sometimes is totally unfair. Silence for the student learning objectives that didn't make it. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. It was so bad. It was so bad. And I wanted to, I wanted to call him and just like, can I help you? Like, I want to help you. Yeah. But, that's a good question. Do, do you, do you do that? I had that same feeling in the, in the fall too. Like, just no. let me help you guys. Just let me. No, I don't. I don't force any of that on the teachers. I always send emails and say, um, you know, if you need help, this is what I do. I'd be happy to help you, but they have to come to me. I'm not going to force it on them because they've already got so much, right? I mean, so many unfunded mandates that they have to deal with on top of a pandemic, on top of. Um, all the regular things that come along with being a K through 12 teacher, you know, so no. And I had a weird situation even where one of my son's teachers applied for an open job that I was on the hiring committee for. Oh, awkward. <laughs> so I knew she wasn't going to ask me for my help. Yeah. She already thought she could become an instructional designer, which wasn't necessarily wrong. I don't, I don't know how it went. I recused myself from that uh, interview. <laughs> Speaking of becoming an instructional designer, so starting from like the top down, what people think it's going to be versus what is it really? And I have to say that I was very disappointed when I got into instructional design and then I actually got into the job and found out it was nothing like what it was pitched to me. In, really? in fact, no. No, you know, I, I'm a glorified blackboard administrator. I don't get to tell teachers how to teach in any way whatsoever. It's how do I how do I put this on blackboard? So 
I, but I think that differs. Yeah. I think that differs Your from. Support staff. Well, yeah, I think that differs <laughs> though, depending on what kind of instructional designer job you get. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, and, and actually, that that um, one of the upcoming discussions I want to have with you is about this framework for ID. The 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 fact that we don't actually have a university a universal description of what an instructional designer is that you almost have to backtrace it to what the university is or what the organization is or the, the client per se to find out quote unquote, what an instruction designer there would even be. God, I think that starts from academia from the top down because in researching it, they can't even decide on a universal term for instructional design. It, I mean, that's kind of become the catch-all since the, um, since the pandemic. But honest to God, everybody just, you know, oh, it's, if it's online, it's instructional design. No, it's not. It's something totally different, right? Right. And then the elements of project management and design thinking and cat wrangling <laughs> and the, the different skill sets that are drawn on to, to, to make an instructional design. And, and it, it matters, that, I guess, at what part in the content development process they're, they're inserted in, right? Are they at the curriculum development stage? Are they at the production stage? Are they at the, you know, the handoff stage where a faculty member has developed their stuff ahead of time and now they're done, quote, unquote, and they're ready to hand it over to somebody to turn it into a course? Um, but do they really? University. Do they really <laughs> hand it over? They don't really hand Let's be real. They don't ever hand over their material. That's how they used to do it at one of our um, sister institutions. They would come in with a box and each professor would drop off their box of materials. And it's like, this is my online class. Make this a class. I don't and see. This is the problem with you. I don't know if you're like full of shit right now or if you're serious. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah, oh so my when, God. Um, at our institution, we've, we've, looped in some other partner institutions that are in our system to be part of our Blackboard instance so that they can they can share in the resources and share in our, our support staff. And when we were trying to figure out what an instructional designer meant to one of these institutions, we had an interview with the outgoing instructional designer, myself and, and one of the other instructional designers. And we met with her for about an hour and just talked about what it meant to be an instructional designer at her university. And this was probably four years ago because she left that job and that job was vacant for a year while we partnered up with her. So they didn't have any instructional designer on staff for a year after they had literally been just dropping off boxes to this ID for her to build their entire course uh, from a box of, of materials. That's insane. That's insane. Yeah. So that's another one no, of those. We do that. We work. <laughs> Well, that's another one of those ideal versus reality things, right? You think that that your staff is going to come to you with the technology skills to give you what you need to put the class together. And I mean, I've said this myself, I've serviced English people and they literally got their PhDs in 1980s so they don't touch computers unless they have to so it's been a yeah. real struggle just to get unless them they unless they just happen to want to use a computer outside of that yeah which is not very many of them mm -hmm. at least in higher ed and this is why i think that um k through 12 and and i will fight people who say otherwise i think k through 12 did a better pivot to online education than higher ed did, at least higher ed that didn't have the support. I would say that our university is probably um, different because we have such a robust support staff, but in other people that I've spoken to in higher education, um, it's been a train wreck. I mean, it is. And, and so yeah. the K through 12 people yeah. that I know are doing so much better because they're so used to having to be flexible. Yeah, in fact, in the, in the higher ed, the people that jumped in and did a great job first were the people that don't care what their faculty have to say. It was the, <laughs> so the, 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 the large-scale educational businesses that just treat this as the, the faculty members are not there as some sort of you know, 
a, a union-backed group of, of individuals. Uh, uh, I mean, they are their individuals instead. So um, they were able to pivot and say, here's all of our online classes. We're an online you know, university now, and they attach themselves to other existing universities to get the name recognition, and they soared in initial um, enrollments online. Their classes are probably all over the place as far as quality. Oh, can we please talk about that? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm out of time. <laughs> I will talk about that from a, um, definitely from a, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, not so much student. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, I'm not the only one who's continuing my education in my household. My husband just got his bachelor's degree and he's a 50 year old man. So, um, oh, he's done. He finished. Yeah. He just graduated. Oh, so, cool. proud. so proud. Yay. Um, he says now he can go get a real job. <laughs> Which, yeah, it didn't matter. Um, anyway, you know, in looking at watching over his shoulder, seeing some of the courses that he was taking, it, it was legitimately painful for me as an ID because I know that his professors had the resources available. I mean, they were literally my people and I know what kind of people they are. They, they were reaching out. They're trying to help these professors. And there yeah. are some that so just... So for you, the benefit of the doubt has been stripped away because you, you know way too much about what resources were available for them. That exactly. And, and the fact that, I mean, people have to start taking instructional design seriously because these classes are a commodity for the universities. Well, that goes back to even before the pandemic. Like, how, how prepared are these, are these people, are these instructors... Um, to put anything online. I mean, we talked about uh, taught while under rapid development versus um, just in time. I, I try to keep my professors. I, I look, I know. Front loading a course is painful. It's a lot of work. But if you could stay two weeks ahead of the course, you could still do some very functional planning versus it's the night before <laughs> and I've, I've got to get something up because the week opens tomorrow. Right, so, right. Provided you don't have a student with, you know, captioning needs or you've got some sort of, of other And that's the point. Process or, yeah. Exactly. Very that good. That is the point. We solve all the time. <laughs> Plan your classes and yeah. do it earlier. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Talk about uh, <laughs> objectives, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Well, and, and one of the blog posts I've, I've um, been working on is about the evolution of the wheel and lessons we can learn from that about instructional design. And I, I, it, it, I may have muddled the analogy because I'm using it in like two different ways, but the, the, the wheel as the evolution of instructional design and delivery of online classes, uh, quote unquote online, with the first one being you know, the stone wheel, we're talking about correspondence courses that were mailed out to people, right? Once it's out there in the world, you're, you're not pulling over and fixing your, your flat tire. You, you've got a big hunk of stone, and it's going to be fine as long as what you are driving on doesn't change, right? As soon as the technologies associated with, with what was possible changed, then obviously the delivery methods began to change and evolve, even though people continued to use correspondence courses up until, I mean, they're still doing it. But um, the, the, the shifts became possible because of these other things like radio and TV. And then when I started thinking about the spokes of a wheel, I started thinking about the each spoke being a contact point between the the learner and the material and the technology, right? So you've got 16 spokes, you've got 16 weeks of class, you've got to make sure that each each semester, each student and each week is making the same kind of contact with the material, right? So you want things that are quote unquote mass produced, right? So then you begin to look at publisher content, you bring in things that are made by other experts that you can rely back on, trying to make all of your own content yourself, like this, you know, stone wheel that you carved um, back in the cave days of, of, of course one switches. Well then you start you start trying to improve the delivery method. Well now you've got high speed internet, you've got these massively improved roads. You can't get out there with your horse and buggy and your 16 spoke wooden wheel. You need to get a mass-produced tire. You need to get something that can withstand the pressures of the environment that it's expected to survive in. 
and to keep people going at the, the speed that they are supposed to be going. Yeah, but that takes you into a whole new set of skills as an instructor that I think a lot of people weren't prepared to do. Like this, you have to have a webcam, you have to know how to speak on camera, you have to know how to use technology. I mean, it's it's yep. not same, going... Same deal, yep. same deal with the wheel analogy. You know, once you get to that point where it's highly mass produced and you can't pull the spokes out of a, a wheel that you've already paid you know, a company to make, a million of them. Now you've got to go back to the design phase. You've got to go back to the instructional designer. You've got them to redo lessons. You've got to pull the material down. You've got to, right, the more intricate you get and the more responsive you try to be to, to current trends and technology, the less likely you are to be able to adapt on the fly and to do things like you were saying as far as make the lectures the night before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then when you switch things, right, you try to switch manufacturers, try to switch publishers, well, now you've got to read all the chapters again. You can't just go off of the memory that you had from the fact that you've taught the same book for years in a row, now you've got to make multiple different uh, changes all at once. So technically that's a good practice anyway. You should be <clears throat> reviewing your material every year. You shouldn't be putting the same stuff out there just because it worked last year. I'm not saying that you can't carry across a lot of it, but you need to review your material. I mean, maybe if you're doing 18th century British literature, that's not going to change, right? But... You Maybe. could always take more white people out of it. <laughs> Agreed. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's things you can do to improve the curriculum of ancient uh, ancient. I said, you know what I mean. There's, yeah, but no, that's true. That's it's so true because things are constantly yeah. in flux. Show is canceled. Show's yeah, I know. We're gone. We're done. No, I think mm, never mind. No, I agree. You were right. This is going to be hard to keep me on topic. It's okay. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> So back to taught while under rapid development, which is pretty much the pandemic response, but that's not the way it should be. It was deceptively marketed, like everything is, um, by saying that, you know, we're just going to do like the online people do, right? We're going to move our stuff and everything's going to be fine. And they weren't able to do like the online people do because they don't know what the online people do and the online students don't do it the same way as the face-to-face -face students. It also involved the populations of students and faculty that had no desire to be online or they would have already been online. Yeah, I think that really mattered. Um, and But moving forward, I think this, this experience really gave people a glimpse into what education could be and it doesn't all have to be in the classroom. So I know a lot of ISDs in Texas are moving forward with online school departments, which I think is great. It's not for everyone. I understand that and I'm not advocating for that. But my point in even bringing this up today is that it's not the train wreck that it's being painted out to be. I think yeah, had they actually a followed uh, principles. The marketing equation. Yeah. When, it, when it's marketed deceptive, then the feedback is, is skewed uh, heavily. So I don't want to see. I don't want to see the industry, um, especially as an instructional designer moving forward. I don't want to see the industry with this stigma on it that online education is not effective. It's very effective when done properly. And, and the pendulum swinging. I don't want it to swing back too far and, and vilify the people that are doing just-in-time design in their courses online well, right? If there's just a few pieces that they replace each week or, or each you know, semester to keep things fresh while the rest of the content is stable or based on, on publisher content or built up because of some department on the um, I think we have a tendency as people to just say, well, that's wrong and we obviously shouldn't be doing it at all when there is, there's viable reasons to do uh, just-in-time development. I think one of the... The issues that we come across as an ID um, when we're developing ahead of time is that, especially in higher education, there, there doesn't seem to be as much of a focus on pedagogy as there is. And I guess in, in higher ed, it would be andragogy because they're not kids, right? But still, there's not a focus on the learning process as much as there is on K through 12. And I don't think that 
higher education people, I, I hate to say it like this, but I don't think they should be allowed to design their online courses if they don't have that training. And <laughs> pretentious, I know, um, God forbid I tell a PhD he doesn't know what he's doing, but when it comes to instruction, like I'm not telling you how to how to do your content. You know all about you know molecular biology, but I know teaching. So right, right, you right. wouldn't want me yeah, to teach molecular biology. So why um, don't you exactly come to the experts? They're fine with that. They just don't know they are because they're not <laughs> thinking about it in the right terms, right? Because like they're fine with somebody setting up the accrediting standards for their programs. Right? They're fine with that being determined outside of their control. They're fine with people telling them, you know, email is an effective tool versus, you know, writing it in the sky or whatever they wanted to do initially. But when you get into some of this stuff where they're like, I learned it by looking at a chalkboard. Why can't they learn it by looking at a chalkboard like I learned it? Because people want to punish the, the next generation in the same way that they were punished. Maybe that's a little harsh. No, but. no. So there's a, there's an author. I can't remember his name. I know his first name was Jamie um, something. We had to do a book study on him, but he's the blueberry guy. Um, it, in any K through 12 teacher that is listening to this will be like, I know that guy. Um, but at the end of the day, his big thing was, and he called it nostalgia. Um, it's a it's a combination oh, of okay. nostalgia amnesia and nostalgia. amnesia because this is the way I learned. I'm like, okay, great. But we have brought up an entire generation who literally have a phone in their face from birth. And we're teaching them with these short attention spans and we're teaching them with all this multimedia. Me, Do what? So it reminds me, I got to get my 18 month old phone. <laughs> But we teach them from early on that this is how, you know, you interact. And then we say, okay, now sit still for 90 minutes and look at this board while I talk. And they don't understand why there's a disconnect between them and the students. You know, my favorite example from my own uh, life in journalism school was I finally had a class in the journalism college that was in the um, computer room. And I know this, probably most people listening to this that are not 40 are like, what do you mean? <laughs> or whatever, right? We, we finally had a class in the computer room. It, you had to fight to get your class scheduled in that room, in that building, right? There were three different departments fighting for that room. And so I get in there. It's my third semester, I think, as a journalism student. And the first, the first day, the teacher says, okay, everybody turn your monitors off and turn your chairs around and face into the room because we're not going to be using these computers this semester. Oh my God, that hurts. It hurts. And we didn't. Wow. We used them to do our homework, but after you know class was over, because then then it turned back into a lab with lab hours. So we were then allowed to turn our monitors back on and do our homework. That's and insane. And she didn't understand how to how to utilize a class that was in a lab. So for her. It was rightly so, but going to be a distraction because it, it, why she asked to be in the computer lab, I never found out. Um, she had to fight for it. I guess she fought for it for so long she didn't remember why she was fighting to be in there. I don't know. Um, that that was that was kind of a perfect example to me of of just my beautiful hopes and dreams being dashed. <laughs> So that brings me to something that I say all the time um, that I think from the instructor standpoint that they have to consider. Are you here to teach or are you here to help your students learn? And that's across the board. I've seen that from K through 12 all the way through higher ed, um, through the doctorate program. There are some people who just want to talk about what they love and they don't care if the student gets it. And then there are those teachers who, at all costs, sometimes to the detriment of their own health, who go swing to the other side of the pendulum and, you know, they're like going to make sure those kids leave with the knowledge that they know. And right. there's nothing wrong with either instructor. 
But there is yeah. there is a level of effectiveness on one side versus the other. And as an instructor, if you're not willing to at least bend a little bit, your instruction is meaningless, basically. Yeah, yeah. Or at least, you know, it's accessible to the people that, that get it. Mm-hmm. And the others are just lost. And if you're, you know, someone else in the university that cares about like retention rates, like that professor may for some reason not care about retention rates. A lot of people only care about their specific part of the interaction. Like you said, right? Like they're an inter- they're a lecturer and they get up there and they're going to lecture for 45 minutes. And it's the student's job to figure out what just happened. <laughs> right? What, what does it mean? What's it connected to? Is it on the mm-hmm. test? I, I had a professor in psychology, I got an F in, um, at another university, uh, my community college, where nothing that she lectured about in the entire semester was ever on the test. That's insane. What's the point the of that? Thing. And they were her experiences as a psychologist over a 20 year period, and they were about psychology, but she didn't feel like making any test questions about any of it. So all we did for the tests was related directly to the chapter. And so the assessment portion of her class was 100% handled by publisher content, and the lecture portion of her class was 100% handled by her, and they were 100% disconnected. Yeah, that tells me that she had no clear objectives. She had no clear, I, I mean, there's no, no scope and sequence there. It's basically two courses in one. Pick one. <laughs> right, and without a clear understanding ahead of time that nothing from the lectures was going to be tested over. All it wasn't until reason. I started failing the exams that I realized I needed to be rereading the chapters and not taking notes in the, le- in the lecture by then it was too late. So what's the point um, of even having the instructor? Because you could have the book, right? I mean, well, do you do you have to pay $3,500 for a book? No, thankfully it was community college. It was <laughs> 50 right 250 right there. there you go. It was dirt cheap. But the F, the F was uh, worth everything. <laughs> and that's, that's like, yeah, if you're going to develop your course without an IT, what are you relying on? Are you relying on publisher content? Are you relying on what you've learned? If you're relying on your own passion to make your students uh, prepared for the next things they have to deal with in life, you, you, you might not need an instructional designer to make your students succeed in your course materials the way that they're currently developed and designed, but you can always make it better. So that was an, another experience that um, my husband had with the community college that he went to. He had a logic professor who literally knew nothing about teaching online, but you could tell in his presentations that he was trying to take what he knew in the classroom and he was doing his very best to adapt it to an online space. And inadvertently he hit on every single best practice, like just, just because out of sheer will, I, I, at one point I had, I had a conversation with him. I was like, I gotta, I told my husband, I've got to talk to this guy. Like I need to talk to him. I need to find out what they're doing at that university that he is doing this so well. And when I talked to him, he's like, um, nothing. Like, I don't know anything about this. And I thought I was doing a really crappy job and I'm really happy to hear that somebody thinks I'm doing a good job. So, I mean, I'm not saying that, that some professors can't trip across it. They do. Right. They yeah, do. Yeah. Just naturally um, step into the right direction. I mean, I can't think of anything more offensive than, than somebody that can just figure this out without <laughs> us needing to tell them. <laughs> but that being said, you know, honestly... Why work that hard when you have the resources available to you? And I see, honestly, though, the, the unfortunate thing is I see those people, that exact person, make the mistake of then saying, I don't need an instruction designer to help. Mm-mm. I figured all this stuff out, right? And it's like they've reached a plateau and they don't understand that there is still so much more that they can do and see and achieve. Um, you know, based on, and, and not just using technology for technology's sake, but to, to actually implement some of the things that they didn't understand were possible, um, even even if they got so much right. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, a lot of them don't get it right. That's why it's pitched for our industry. 
<laughs> okay, so now that we're talking about the sales pitch for the industry, let's talk about ideal versus reality. Because anybody who wants to get into this needs to know. Um, I personally think you don't need a degree. You don't need a degree. Do you feel that we need a degree? I mean, you you hire instructional designers. What is it that you look for? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, for the um, record, I don't think that he wanted to hire me. I think I only got hired because I knew somebody else there. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> who did you know? What? Are you kidding me? I can't say his name because then everybody, he'll get in trouble. <laughs> no, in my own personal growth aside, because I've been wrong about people before. We have another instructional designer on our team that I was wrong about, but I didn't understand why other people thought that, that she should be an instructional designer and what her take on things was, was valued at. And that was my own growth that needed to happen. It wasn't like she needed to do anything different to prove herself to me. I just needed to grow in my understanding of what all the different facets of our job can require because of how different the different faculty or different programs and different colleges that we manage are, not to mention the partner institutions and how they are, everything is different within anyone. Um, so yeah, to not answer your question at all. So going back to it though, because people want to know, I mean, I get this question from teachers all the time at, you know, people are looking to get out of the classroom and it's not, it's not so just our, a matter of... So our situation is unique because we are, um, and, and I've had honestly a, 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 like a soul searching about it too, because we have sought to hire only people recently with uh, advanced degrees because of some... I don't know if it's a perception that we would have to then quote unquote defend our choice with a human resources department that is focused upon what a university would want. Um, if you want to be a quote unquote, you know, higher up in academic instructional design, then you almost do need a degree because you need to be able to communicate at all of the different levels that it takes to communicate with faculty that are in education that understand the science of learning, faculty that are in sciences that don't understand the science of learning and don't care, faculty that are anywhere in between, faculty that have picked up a bunch of stuff on their own through books and conferences and still have to be able to be useful and help them. Um, I don't know, Thomas. I disagree on this. I disagree. I don't think you need the degree. I think you need to have an understanding of what works. Well, and like I said, I'm going works. through a social team about it too, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm wrong again. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying we are going to agree to disagree on a lot of things in this podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't even need to because I'm already in the middle. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're and, and it's like part of what – well, no, no, because part of what, what – back back to the framework for ID, right? Our understanding of what we need as an ID doesn't match up necessarily with what other people are doing at the university. So bringing in somebody with a PhD or in a PhD program – and expecting them, because they're so advanced in that particular aspect of it, expecting them to be able to do the advanced things that, that we need people to do in a daily job isn't necessarily true. So maybe starting over with the idea that we need to train student workers up to hopefully offering jobs in so that they can become instructional designers. I can, I can tell you from the corporate side that um, it's more of an understanding of the software they're not looking for the degree. They're looking for a certificate uh, and the ability to create instructional design, the ability to understand the design thinking models. Um, so it's very different. In fact, I was, I was kind of very frustrated when I was looking for an instructional design job that I couldn't get hired on at the university when so many corporations were willing to hire me immediately for twice yeah. the money. So why is it so why is it so hard to get in at the university level versus walking off the street and working for um, a, a you know Fortune 500 company? People need to know why it's so hard to get into the university. Hmm. I mean, I guess it's because there's fewer jobs and a, and a slower cycle 
as far as you know, a, a, a company can decide, okay, we're going to open marketing, we're going to do this program. Program went well, we're going to close marketing, right? We're going to shift budgets, we're going to come up with a new product in two years, right? So it's two years between jobs, and then they come back and they say, okay, we're going to open up marketing, we're going to hire a new company, we're going to hire a new this and do that. So they're constantly going through instructional designers. So that the cycles that they go through is, is completely different than a, than a academic support staff. It's almost like corporate instructional design and academic instructional design shouldn't even be said in the same sentence without clarifying which one you're talking about. I um, and everything that. that I know is about academic instructional design. I don't know anything about the corporate world. Um, so there's the massive grain of salt that you have to take everything I say with is I only know stuff about academic ID. Yeah, but I think that the learning principles across the board are, I mean, because I've been in all three, right? I've been in corporate, I've been in K through 12, and now I've been in higher ed. And I think that across the board, each industry is missing a vital piece. Like K through 12 doesn't give the teachers the autonomy. Um, Higher ed... um, there seems to be a lack of understanding on the technology piece. And then in corporate, they don't have as much of the learning science. So in, no matter where you land, there's, there's a deficit. There's like a blind spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's different, there's different facets of it that are going to be valuable and, and invaluable and uh, useless, depending <laughs> on who you're talking to. And then going through these uh, um, professional development things and, and LinkedIn learning has shown me a lot about the way the corporate people at least communicate. Maybe not necessarily think and, and whatnot, because I'm still getting just a piece of, of it. But at least the, the, the way they communicate shows me a little bit about the way they think about the things that are important to them. And, and some of these ideas are just hilarious to me from an academic, SE, uh, uh, academic ID and SME perspective like these ideas of of simultaneous rapid development and prototyping of of ideas and like no we don't build three versions of somebody's history 1301 class to see which one they like like no we 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 build whatever we can that the the week before it has to launch yeah there's definitely a lack of project management um that in in higher ed, and I'm not saying that strictly from my point of view, I mean, speaking to many IDs who work in higher ed, it is, it's very much a fly by the seat of your pants. This is how we're going to get this done. Um, we're not really going to put a lot of thought into it. Needs analysis. What the hell is that? Like, we, we don't even, we don't even contemplate student need. Like what? I mean, yeah. So. And that's kind of, I guess the, um, I'm going to say it's a dirty secret of academic ID, but it's, it's, it's what you're served with when you get in the army, right? Like you don't get the, the meal that's in the, um, the, <laughs> the PR shot. You, you get what's served in the mess hall. And that's what, that's what it is with academic ID. And um, I guess I'm just used to it. <laughs> All right, you want to move into yeah, pandemic um, response? Hey. Yeah, yeah, and, and I chose History 1301 in particular for that example because those are all actually already developed, so none of those are being developed weekly, so don't call me and complain if you teach History 1301 somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Nobody knows who we work for, right? This is all, you're gonna, we're gonna change our faces. Mm, no, no. <laughs> I am gonna be doing a lot of editing, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, All right, so So shifting to pandemic response from a parent point of view, did online education suck? For for the first two weeks, it was great. And then? Yeah. (laughs) Are you scared of Are you scared of kickback from the district? Like, um... no, No, he's he's already done with seventh grade. What can you do to him now? No, um, it was it was a varied response. Some of the some of the some of the teachers I keep wanting to call them back. Some of the teachers had already set up, excuse me, quite a bit of elaborate stuff inside of Canvas for their classes, and so they were able to rely on existing materials, which is what you know we would have recommended they do in that in that situation anyway. But the the breakdown being, there was never any guidance to them ahead of time 
for what should have been in there anyway. So nothing was built in any sort of a structured environment. Some people were using the tools inside of Canvas to, 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 to deploy the content and use the system announcements and the, the, uh, the mails. Some of the people had built a you know an infographic style Canvas course where everything is in one big page and you just kind of scroll down through it for the whole semester. And then there were links that were images, there was links that was you know, word art text, there was uh, Boards that you had to click on to get into a class in one class, but the other classes were all based on the system. Some people had Zoom meetings that were optional. Some people had Zoom meetings that were required. You never knew the difference between a Zoom meeting that was a lecture and a Zoom meeting that was a follow-up. Um, and then in the middle of all of that is I, I had my son who didn't want to do work. And after the first two weeks, when it became obvious that the school wasn't doing the work, he stopped doing the work. And he started just getting on YouTube instead. And the culminating uh, moment for us was he had recorded a video of himself. Actually, let me start over the over the couple of, of months that we did this before he had to go back to school. We had hooked the laptop up to the TV in the living room so that we could see what he was working on at all times. Well, he waited for us to be distracted, and he separated the screens again so that. He could record a video of himself taking a typing test and display that on the TV while he watched YouTube on the laptop. And That's I walked through the living room. Freaking brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I, I walked through the living room a couple times until I realized he was taking a typing test without actually typing on the keyboard. And even I put that together and decided that it was time for him to go back to school. <laughs> so you actually brought up two things in that. Um, one of those being you feel like the teachers fell off you know uh, yeah yeah why? the guidance fell off and they they fell off in their in their they were no longer well and here's the deal though because now they were being asked to teach multiple audiences they were asked to be mm -hmm. to, to teach the students that had now come into class and they were being asked to teach the students that were staying home for a parental choice to stay out and in do you think there's so, an effective way to even do that? Because personally, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think you can effectively. I don't think you can effectively teach two two groups at once. I, I just. I don't see it. Um. No. No, you cannot. I don't, I, I don't know. So, I don't know why they try. I, I just. I understand no, you, why they tried. If you ever try to give a lecture to people in a live audience in front of you with a laptop next to you on a podium with a live audience inside of some sort of remote session and you've tried to keep everybody engaged and judge whether or not, you know, even if it's only 30 people, you've got 10 in front of you and 20 online, you're now asked to gauge whether all of them are engaged for the entire time, whether they're assessing the lesson and whether or not they're even there. So you've got to have the camera on with these and you've got to keep watching all of them. Um, it's impossible. No, teachers don't even have a super high success rate when all the kids are in person. Right? Exactly. Exactly. I, I thought it was incredibly unfair to ask, yeah. um, to ask instructors that's, that's, to do that's that. That's why all my prevaricating and, and equivocating is because I don't want people to just say, okay, here's another group of idiots blaming the teachers. Uh, no. I mean, as a teacher, I got it. I mean, I get it. And as a parent, I did too. And as an instructional designer, it's like I didn't want to put any extra, you know, pressure on these people. Um, and so I was, I tried to do everything I could, but I was also extremely busy in my day job, so I couldn't actually do the parenting that I needed to do for an online student at home in a uh, not a hostile online environment, but a super reluctant online environment. And then he was hostile to the fact that he knew it was only like two hours worth of work a day. So instead of just doing it and then move on with his day. He just wanted to fight for every inch of the ground. Do you think the lack that. of consistency across the um, across the models mattered? It might not have mattered per se to him, but if let's say he let's say he wanted to do the work, right? God forbid you've got a kid that likes to do schoolwork. I was. I think he would have. I would have been, he would have been fine. He would have, he would have been able to find what he wanted. But since he wasn't super interested in doing it all, um, I had to go and find out what he was actually missing, what he was lying about, what he was wrong about, and what he missed. 
And for me, there was no easy way to quickly follow up on seven different classes built in seven different ways at seven different times. Um, some of which were required, some of which weren't used. Uh, one of which wasn't even being taught by the person that he was actually supposed to be in. So he was in the wrong person's class for like three weeks. And I, I, I had no way to know until I called the school and was like, look, I'm not getting what I need to for him for this. And I'm like, he's not even supposed to be in that class. That lady's not teaching online anymore. She's back in the classroom. And I said, well, I would explain the, the lack of uh, material from her. As, as an ID and a creative person, I, I feel when I was given a, uh, a template that I was supposed to use, I was very resentful of that template because I was like, there's no room for creativity. But now being on the ID side, I see where the template really mattered from the student point of view. And that consistency is really important. I mean, there's still plenty of room to, to be creative throughout the course, but I see now the, the, the value of a standardized template across an institution. Yeah, yeah, right. And at certain levels, like, I don't see any reason why you can't just make some of those decisions as an as a institution and, and say, you know, like, this is how we start a course. And then make your, your, your personality show inside of that format in some way. I think where the institutions screw up is that they don't look for the instructor feedback before they make that, that template. You need to ask the teachers. You need to ask the instructors, the professors. You need to ask their opinion before you give them. Because I will say that the original template that I was given in the K-12 through um, industry was garbage. I mean, there wasn't clear navigation. Um, the The material was not nested in an efficient manner. It was just a garbage template. And if they would have asked teachers what would work, we already knew. But right, we weren't right, allowed right. to have that input. And, you know, and if it's a situation where, you know, quote, unquote, they just couldn't get the teachers together to agree on things. Like, I can understand that to happen. And then you just, you, you, you roll out with whatever you have. But then you, you have to make it intentional to come back to them and ask how it went and to ask what to do next time. Or you're just being authoritative with, with, no, with no mechanism for, for outlet. All you're doing is creating things. And then you're going to get 27 different templates and parents who can't find their kids' mm-hmm. schoolwork and we're all pissed yeah. off. Yeah. Or you're going to have a template that um, you have but is laxly enforced, which leads to no template. So one more, one more chunk to go. Hurricane Harvey. See, I don't know anything about this. I wasn't here when you did this. So. Yeah. So this was interesting um, for us because it, it, it wasn't the same as the painting. It was different, but we did have to do a lot of rapid development and repositioning. And we had to deal with the fact that entrenched policies and procedures at the university level are not um, easily adapted to emergency responses to things. So we had to do a lot of other people's work for them ahead of time and then show them it and say, here, this is what it's supposed to do. Now you just do it. You have to elaborate because that does not make any sense. Okay, good. Well, and I was trying to not get in trouble. Um, Basically, if you have, for instance, enrollment processes, right? The students are coming into class, they're leaving class, they have to call, they have to do an email, they have to sign documents, right? There's always these procedures and processes that are attached to everything that happens in university. And there's no way to to, to step around the bottom. So when you have to deal with people that can't get access to their email, that can't get access to a phone, that don't have power, and you don't want them to you know, not exist in the system anymore, be considered dropped. And there was a lot of different uh, pieces that were moving that had to be decided without input ahead of time and then delivered to people. Um, that, that's what I meant as far as that. So No, that makes sense. Because, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a different situation depending on... on- you know, obviously corporate would just come to a screeching halt. 
Um, K through 12, you don't have the option. You don't have the luxury. You are still expected to deliver that education regardless. But it's not as much of a big deal because higher education is more on the profit side, right? So they paid for this product. You're not delivering it. So what do you yeah. do? Yeah, we're like Waffle House. We, <laughs> we don't close during a disaster. No. No, and, and we actually we did close uh, for a while there. And then when we reopened, we had to make a decision about what do we do? Do we delay start? Do we shift to multiple semesters? And we ended up allowing the faculty members to opt in to a, a plan that would basically delay their start until the second half of the semester so that their students could just take a shortened term later if they wanted to, or they could just have them start now, and they would just have to a, a, adapt to something internally for, for students they couldn't get a hold of. Um, and then we had, we had a, a, a shift in my thinking was about email and how email is a natural disaster disaster, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you've got... We, we were trying to send notifications out to people and we wanted to make sure that the students were finding out about what was going on and relying on email. They, they, they would have 100, 200, 300 emails when they got back to the to power, got to their power turned back on. So we had to make sure that things were sent into a course announcement so that it was then also populated out into an email. And then learning a, I guess, a, a, a strategic way to structure communications around what kinds of device access people are going to have in different situations was it was a very valuable lesson that that paid forward and then just thinking about the policies that needed to be looked at and the policies that we would need to, to at least tell people about helped with with um with the covid response too yeah talking about tech equity um you know I Again, friends in K through 12 who taught Title I schools, some of their students just dropped off the map because they didn't have the tech at home and the district wasn't equipped to make sure that they had, even if they had the ability to give them a Chromebook, you know, that doesn't guarantee internet access at that point. So if you're developing a a um, emergency plan, you've got to be prepared to service those students who have those tech equity issues. And I don't think that a lot of people take that into consideration. And the ones that do, I mean, one of the, the cruel and heartless things that I heard was, well, you know, it's their fault. They should have bought a computer. Um, you know, for a first generation student who is trying to get their degree, um, supporting their parents, working, you know, you don't know, you, you can't, to put that burden on those students yeah. was, was one of the things about the pandemic that really just pissed me off. And, you know, normally my answer is they should just buy a laptop um, because we deal specifically with students that have agreed to sign up for the online experience and to do that without the technology to me seems irresponsible, but that's a whole different conversation, right? Than the people that were forced into this. Right. Um, and, I, and I think it, in the South in particular, I think a lot of schools just said, then fine, just come to class. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I get it. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Um, I have technology everywhere. So I was able to have my son at home without needing to check out technology. But I see the emails from my son's school now uh, last week about turning in the technology. So they still have people even, even to the end of the, the semester that were um, remote students. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm happy that my district and my school uh, for my son was still willing to do that, even though I wasn't making use of it, I think that's great. Um, I don't know what the experience was in the second semester, if it got better, because I didn't, I didn't choose to send it back. Uh, or I, I, mean, I, I kept it in school, I didn't choose to do homeschool again. I think that they did a better job during the second semester simply because, you know, the learning curve. Um, yeah. And they're just so adaptable. They have to be flexible. But I don't think that it was um, – I, I, I'm tired of hearing I mean, the term yeah. learning gap because now there's a learning gap. Is there? Is there really a learning gap? I mean, I'm sure there is. That I'm sure it's going to be studied, and I'm sure there's going to be a, an avalanche of papers about it. 
But I'm not sure that that learning gap wasn't there before the pandemic and the pandemic just magnified it or amplified it. And what do you mean by learning gap? Uh, a lot of um, parents are complaining about the the lack of instruction time that the students got that you know there's there's now where they should be reading at this level they're uh, a year behind or where mathematically they should be at this level but they didn't learn this this and this oh, okay. and I'm like yeah. well um yeah that's the parents fault <laughs> oh that's a whole podcast in itself <laughs> As, as, a, as a parent, I'm going to have to say that's, that's, uh, that's your fault. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely have that conversation. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's wrap it up. How you want to? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the other thing I wanted to say about faculty flexibility and autonomy and all of that during, the, um, during Harvey and then the pandemic was about when you are using all of these prepackaged materials, right, when everything is canned, it, you, you, you can't necessarily – Adapt it as easily as you can your own you know, lecture material, your own test questions, the things that, that you have developed over time through your own rigorous pain. Um, whereas when you're dealing with you know publisher content, you're just like, okay, I guess you know week two and three are now together. Like everything is so layered and so connected, and like back to the real analogy, you know, you're not going to pull just one of those spokes out when things go off off the rails, and you need to repair your course or, or alter your course midstream because of a, of a disaster or, or personal, you know, injury or, or health issue where you need to switch uh, as a as an instructor that's allowed to do that switch remotely midstream. Um, whereas if you've got oh, you know, I've I did these lectures, I can pop in this lecture, I can tell the students to fast forward 20 minutes into this lecture, you know it so much better than you were the one that created it. So the, the, but then the, also it's, it's a personality, right? If you're an inflexible professor anyway, then it, it doesn't matter how flexible your content is. Um, and then that we kind of, I, I don't know, I want to heavily judge administration, but there wasn't enough there wasn't enough guidance in, in enforcing of people's flexibility, right? So students were allowed to fail. That probably should have been told to take an incomplete. Yeah. Because of, of different pieces of the puzzle that we're not allowed to say to students, right? Like, yeah, you lost your house in Harvey and you're taking care of your grandma in a van. I know you said you're gonna be ready to take this class in the second half of the semester, but really? Are you really? And I don't, I don't know, I don't know exactly how all those questions were answered because obviously I'm not in the academic advising team or any of that. I'm assuming they gave the students the best advice they could have at the time, but there's always that fear that it was too heavily focused on what the university needed to survive. Mm -hmm. Versus what the student needed. Yeah, and that's why I'm always told to shut up. Um, <laughs> and that's why we make such good company. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. On disposabledesignpodcast.com, you can find blogs that, that we are writing about our journeys through the education industry and as instructional designers. And you'll also be able to uh, watch and or listen to our shows. We'll also post videos on instructional design as well as software tutorials on the newest, hottest ed tech and learning management systems. You can also hit us up on Twitter. If you're so inclined and have any questions about instructional design, thanks so much for watching.